Um, before we dive in, I, I, I wonder how many of you grew up, maybe I could see your hands if you, who grew up hearing missionary stories at some level with your, with, whether a flannel graph or something when you were a kid. Did anybody remember those things? You heard some of the stories. Probably you heard stories of men who, and women who faced incredible obstacles and suffered really drastic loss on what was what was by all by all measurements a good thing a good task even a god-given task one of the clearest that we all i know should hear of is you picture a story that that maybe we don't know as many details as we'd like about but paul and barnabas and their team traveling through uh the hard journey of the gospel witness and seeing god work in incredible ways by turning people from sin to trust Christ, or turning Jews who were worshiping the living God to worship Him faithfully in Jesus Christ in these different synagogues, but also in the same way, finding great persecution and resistance. And Paul is an, a unique person, I think, in the sense that we, we find him and others rejoicing that they could suffer for the gospel, and sometimes they feel almost out of touch, right? Right? But imagine um, this band of brothers carrying on in the gospel mission and one day they wake up ready to move ahead. Perhaps they're going through the mountains of, of Asia there and they're, they're, they're traveling to the next place to proclaim the gospel and, and one of the brothers who they've sweat with, cried with, even bled with... <coughs> John Mark looks at Paul and looks at Barnabas and says, I got to go back. I can't do this anymore. I've got to leave. I, this is too much. And, and the, the, the beatings inflicted a certain type of wound, right? And, and the resistance, it inflicted a certain type of pain. But this pain seems to be a pain that even from later chapters in Acts, uh, in Acts, we see struck Paul deeply. That when John Mark, thank the grace of God, seems to understand that that was not what he was called to do, wants to join them again, and Paul and Barnabas have sharp division because of the pain and the intense setback that, that was caused there. Other people Paul faced, they, they didn't come back. They abandoned the faith, causing real pain. And the, the reason I think of them is because they were on a very clear, God-given mission with a, a, an objective that was for the glory of God. And yet, as they face not just the resistance of a world that doesn't want to submit to God, but even the, set, the, the demoralizing setback of abandonment, they must have been questioning and asking a question that I think all of us in this room will, will ask at some point. And all Christians should ask so that they prepare themselves. And that question is this. How do we account for the delays and disappointments that we find in the plan of God? How do we account for and handle setbacks? How does the Christian approach not just a disappointment because you wanted to get lunch at a certain place and everyone voted somewhere else? The simple things. But when you think, I'm trying to obey the Lord faithfully, I'm laying my hand to what I think He wants me to do, and you face demoralizing setbacks, or desperate, desperate level suffering. What do you do? How do you respond? And I think that this passage in Exodus is included by Moses to inform the people of God that the process of realizing the promises of God has always almost involved these setbacks and these sufferings and that the people of God need to take both lesson and, and encouragement from the example even of the people that encountered the Exodus and, and respond accordingly, respond appropriately. That, that God, He is trustworthy. His word and His character are trustworthy. 
even in the face of desperate suffering and demoralizing setbacks. That God is. He is faithful. He's trustworthy. He has spoken truly. He is worthy to be trusted Himself, even in the face of these things. And we're going to see that in this passage today, I think. So let's begin by looking at Exodus chapter 4, verse 29 through 31, because I believe that it sets the context. Some of you weren't with us. Some of you just, I mean, it's a long week. We forget, right? Moses and Aaron brought together the elders of the Israelites in verse 29 of chapter 4, and Aaron told them everything, right, that the Lord had said to Moses. (coughs) He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. Things are going well, right? And And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. When the Moses and Aaron come to Israel, remember, God had said he interrupts Moses' life 80 years in probably, and and we know that he's actually been interrupting Moses' life for a long time, right? Even getting him out of the basket and into Pharaoh's house, but he doesn't know that. And and he interrupts Moses' life. This man's probably 80 years or 40 years old, um, no, excuse me, 80 years old. Yes, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness. And, 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 and tells him, I've got this mission. I've heard the call of my people. I've heard their cry. I remember my promises I made to their forefathers. I'm going to deliver them. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to march into the superpower of the world, the most powerful man on earth, and you're going to tell him, let my people go. It's going to work out. He's going to resist, but it's going to work out. And in chapter 4, we see things going according to plan, even smoothly. Moses and Aaron have got to feel like, man, this is the way it's supposed to work. The elders of Israel welcome them, believe the message, right? Which most of us have had enough exposure to the Old Testament to know that Israel believing the message is a, an incredible work in and of itself, right? We've heard plenty of times where they don't believe the message. They kill the prophets. Jesus talks about their reputation for that later on, right? They hear them and they believe. And I'm sure Moses and Aaron feel like, man, this is awesome. It's working. God's sending us, here we go. God's really got our back. This is great. And they went, and they were writing in their, their prayer update, God answered our prayers. Awesome. You know, they send that along to the, the people back in Midian or wherever. And Now look at chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, right? And they said, and they said this is what the sovereign Lord, or th- this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Now Moses and Aaron, right, they're riding high. They're pumped. And they're, they're, you've got to picture the rest of the people, the anticipation of a nation who's lived in slavery. They see a man show up speaking on behalf of God. He verifies that by showing them these signs. Remember dropping the snake, or the, the staff that becomes a snake, picking it up again, putting his hand inside the cloak, and it becomes leprous, and then it's healed again. And now this guy who shows up to them in their servitude and says, God's listening to you. He knows you've been suffering, and as we talked about last week, he is intent on delivering you despite all the appearances of the circumstances. They're thinking, this is going to be awesome. They're headed to tell the man who holds their freedom in his hands the message that God has for them. This is the king, right? Now, so remember the story we talked about in Genesis. Joseph sits in prison with a cupbearer and a baker, right? And, and, uh, and one receives a message of what? Restoration. And one receives a dream of what? Condemnation. And Pharaoh's word is the thing that brings that about, isn't it? For the cupbearer, all that he had to do was speak, and the man was restored. He was out of prison, he was free. But also for that, that, that other man... All he had to do was speak, and he was murdered. This is the kind of power in their hands. So, so the hope for Israel is great. They're thinking, wait, this is the guy that speaks, and it just happens. It, this is the Pharaoh, not the same Pharaoh that Joseph once saw, but this is, this is that position of earthly authority that they're going to see. So Pharaoh's just going to simply speak, and we are going to be free. God, this meeting is huge. And you can tell Israel kind of waiting with bated breath, right? The Lord says, let them go. And you hear Moses and Aaron deliver the message of God to Pharaoh, probably in a big room, right, with a a court, and Pharaoh seated above them, looking down at them. And it, it hangs silently in the air. Let the people go. And Pharaoh looks at others in the court, kind of like, wait a second. 
Because what, what had Moses said? This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. And Pharaoh looks at them and says, look at verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? He asks the men standing around him, like kind of loud enough and sarcastically enough that the tone spreads a snicker throughout the whole room. Who? who who's the God they're talking about? Wait, who? Did you guys, I have never heard this name, Yahweh, I am, am I, supposed to, am I supposed to recognize that name, Moses? Am I supposed to understand that this, not only that, let me ask you this, Moses, am I supposed to obey somebody I've never even heard of? He looks right at them as the, you know, the group starts to chuckle around him and says in verse 2, I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. So, the sarcasm perhaps turns into directly, what are you talking about? I'm not doing this. If I just trounced into the president of the United States office and said, this is what you need to do. And God told me. And, and he said, wait, 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 wait a second. You know, there's means for you to try and realize this plan, but it's not by coming in here and telling me your God told me this. Verse 2, God, God told Moses, remember, that, that there was going to be resistance, didn't he? Do you remember God anticipating this and even saying Pharaoh will resist, he will not listen, and even he will resist so much so that I'll take his, own, his son's life at the end of chapter 4. But look verse 3. Moses answers to him, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. You don't understand, Pharaoh, Moses says, right? Our God, he, he met with us. He told me directly, and he commanded me, and he's deadly serious about this. Notice even Moses says, he might, God might judge us if we don't obey. But Pharaoh, he doesn't share their urgency, does he? Look at the passage. He's disgusted by them. Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Verse 4. Get back to their work. Get back to your work. A pause hangs in the air, right? As Moses and Aaron look back at Pharaoh, and he speaks again. Look at the people. If you look at the passage, look at the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. Don't you understand what, how many people you're talking about, Moses? This is hundreds of thousands of people. Are you serious? You really want me to just snap my fingers and send the housemaid out of every Egyptian home? And the, de- the, the laborer that, that cleans the, the cattle stalls and the man that builds the bricks for our construction, you want me just to say, hey, go ahead. The little boys, all the little Hebrew boys that are cleaning our dishes, you want everything to stop by just freeing all these slaves, hundreds of thousands of people just to leave. He looks at them. The economy of Egypt would be wrecked in a day, in a day. You know how many people you're talking about? You're trying to bring an end to Egypt as we know it. This is crazy. This is crazy. And you know why you're doing it? This is why your God's spoken to you, because you figured out a way to conveniently get out of your service. This is a religious conviction that keeps you from all this hard labor. That's what it is. This is convenient. This is an excuse. I've never heard of this God, and now this God is supposed to get you out of being a slave here? How convenient. Wow, did you meet that God in the wilderness? I mean, no wonder. I'm sure you missed the God that wanted you to stay in slavery in the wilderness. Pharaoh looks at him, as people throughout history have and will, at people who long to obey God, and they write off the words of God for them as religiously contrived convenience, commandments. You believe this because it helps you cope with suffering, or you believe this because it it enables you to leverage your morality on others. You believe this because you want our society to be such and such. Pharaoh has the same explanation. These people want to get out of their work, so they've concocted a story. Get your head out of the clouds, Moses. Come back to reality. Come back to reality. There's thousands of slaves that have to keep working for Egypt to keep its pace. There's no religious exemptions in Egypt. You're not getting out of this. Right? And Moses and Aaron, they hear this. 
And you can all, perhaps you can understand the excitement that was in their hearts as Israel listens and believes and worships God. By the way, perhaps the restoration of worship for God in Israel. There isn't much reason for us to believe that they were this remnant in Israel as slaves who were conducting all kinds of faithful worship the way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. It seems like they, they come back to God in such a way, a, at least a faithful worship of Him. So they see this, and now here's what they hear. This utter, absolute rejection, a halt in the plan. You can almost think of Moses and Aaron walking out the doors. Did that just happen? He says he doesn't know God and he has no intention of obeying Him. This is crazy. They thought they would be the cupbearer. Right? They thought they would hear the words of the cupbearer and now it sounds like they are the baker. Like they're about to be beheaded by the king who has the words to do that. Right? That same day, verse 6, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw but require them to make the same number of bricks as they did before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. You see it? He's, made it? He's shown his cards there. Moses and Aaron made this up to get them out of this. Increase the work so they don't even have time to dream. Okay? In the past, Egyptian farms and farmers would collect straw for the Israelites. And the, the stalks, you know, they're harvesting their fields and they'd probably leave the stalks. Just like we bale hay now, they would leave these things for, for the production of bricks. Something that the slaves would most likely have been solely responsible for. But if the farmer is able to now make use of his straw, because Pharaoh said, hey, make them find it themselves. And he no longer has to turn in straw for the protection of, of bricks. The Israelites were most likely now reduced to going out through the fields and finding what had been dropped or cutting off the, you know, the very stubble that was still left and trying to scramble back and continue the work they had been doing of making these bricks. I mean, this is an impossible task that Pharaoh was requiring them to gather all these things and still meet the quota that they had been meeting with the help of all of these farmers and the people in Israel who were giving their straw for the production of bricks. And then the slave drivers. Look what happens in verse 10. The slave drivers and overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced at all. So the message, I mean, can you imagine the expectation turned to fear? Think about this room of, of, of Israelite women and men and fathers holding their children. I'm holding little Judah and I'm waiting to hear the message of deliverance. Remember, the cupbearer, that's who we are. God has said we're going to be delivered. And so Moses and Aaron are meeting with Pharaoh. When they come through those doors, come out of those doors, they're going to say, we've done it. We're free. Pharaoh has let the people go. And instead, we get a message from our slave driver who says, double the work. And essentially, you can see, you can see it in your mind, the anticipation of slaves to be free turned to anxiety. And fathers who are holding their children and now hear this edict that instead of being freed, they're going to be driven harder by their slave labor than worse and ever before with outrageous demands handing their children to their wives because they know that they need to leave right now and try and gather some straw if they're ever going to make this. And the sickness that, that in their hearts is happening as they go, what in the world is going to happen? And they realize they'll never meet this quota. Verse 12, it says, The people scattered all over Egypt to gather the stubble to use for straw. The Israelites, they hustle and they sweat and they work long hours. They get up earlier, they stay up later. They skip breaks for meals, and they work at a breakneck pace. They'd always been able to meet their quota if they put in a good, hard day's work. Let's say it's 30 bricks to a man. And the day after the edict, the fastest worker that they all know finished with 12 bricks. And in a week, he was only up to 15 bricks a day. 
After two weeks like this, even though he hadn't eaten or, and barely slept, he'd lost 15 pounds, and the best of us could only muster 17 bricks a day. Unreachable. Nonetheless, verse 13, the slave drivers kept pressing them, complete the work required of you. Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And sweat turns from sweat to tears and blood as the month's report comes out. And Pharaoh receives a, a, a report on his desk that they haven't, they, they've been over 40% behind where they always are. And he says, these distracted, dreaming Israelites, they miss their quota of bricks because they want to leave. They miss their quota of bricks because they've got this religious preoccupation. They're dreaming about what their God said in the wilderness, and now they can't do their work. He's blinded to the fact that the reason they can't do their work is his, his harsh oppression. But he's furious. This is just what I expected. Those dreamers are being lazy. And Moses and Aaron are taking the people from their work. They're laying around, slacking off, because they think they'll be free soon. So verse 14, Pharaoh's and slave drivers beat the Israelites' overseers, right? They had appointed, demanding them, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today or before? The, this whole time, I think that's a, a, a description of the, this whole time, because I don't think that they're just talking about, like they went out for one day's work or the other. I think the text indicates that this is something that was a significant oppression, and, and we'll see, continues. Well, where is it? Where's the work? And, and, and imagine us standing by as we have worked our fingers to the bone and one of our friends who's been appointed by the Egyptians as the, the, over, the crew leader is being brutally beaten because though we skipped meals and though we got up before the sun and stayed up till after and though we've lost weight and can barely survive, we can't meet the quota and they're being beaten bloody in front of us. Can you imagine the desperation? Days on days on days on end, literally begging for their lives, right? Because they, they, you could cut the desperation in Israel with a knife. So what is 15? The Israelites' overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. These desperate men, exhausted for days, they are on boat break back neck work, right? They're literally in front of Pharaoh begging for their lives. And you know what Pharaoh snarls as he looks down in verse 17? You can see him look down at them in the same place that he looked at them, Moses and Aaron. There's probably blood soaking through the backs of these men's clothes as they barely clean themselves up enough to stagger before Pharaoh and look like they haven't been in what they've been through. And he says, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go sacrifice to the Lord. And Pharaoh's words absolutely sucker punch, knock the wind out of these men. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Not a desperate hope, and it works, but doubling down by a man whose word is authoritative, right? And the Israelite overseers, they come in verse 19, and they realize they're in trouble. And they, they tell, you, they, when they're told, you, you, the, the quota's staying the same. You, you're not meeting this because it is laziness. And the script is flipped. You know, Moses and Aaron, they're outside the doors waiting to find out how the meeting went. And they come out and they look at Moses and Aaron and the words the scripture gives us says, may the Lord look on you and, and judge you. Because you, Moses and Aaron, you have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword to their hand to kill us. You did this. You messed us up. You have got us up a creek without a paddle. There is no way that this is what God wanted. You said this is what God wanted. You said that if we obeyed, if we turned to the Lord and we worshiped the Lord, that Pharaoh was going to let us go and we would be in a nation our own back in the promised land as God had promised Abraham. And now I'm pretty sure that I almost worked myself to death and then got beat for it and then told I was lazy and then I had another month to expect of it. You did this. 
This is not what God wanted from us. We're on the brink of dying, and this is your fault, Moses. You told God, you told Pharaoh that God was deadly serious about us worshiping in the wilderness, but God's not going to kill us. Pharaoh's going to kill us. You put a sword in his hand, and he's going to kill us. Moses surely had seen the, the shift leaders in Egypt being beaten, right? And he knew that they were being tortured for an impossible expectation. And now those men are saying, this is, this is your fault. This is crazy. And Moses must be thinking, okay, God, you said there would be resistance. You said Pharaoh's going to say no. But you're going to let... You're going to let them go now, right? This is, this is going to work. It's going to happen. And then as he, they come out of their meeting, Pharaoh has doubled down. And the men walk out, and Pharaoh's, or Moses' heart sinks with their hearts, and their hateful words sting into his desperate soul as well. And look at verse 22. Moses, Moses returned to the Lord. Let me translate that for you, although I don't think this is a translation. He found a place to get alone and pray, I think is the thing. That, and he is desperate. And he says this, Why, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your people? Is this why you sent me? Is this what this looks like? Right? Is this what I was called to do? Moses, the deliverer of Egypt, you sent me to deliver Israel into execution? Ever since I went to Pharaoh, verse 23, to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people. And you have not rescued your people at all. Directly connected to what God said he would do, right? Moses comes and says, wait a second, we had a plan. I was going to come in here, I was going to speak for you. Pharaoh would say no, but then, you know, so okay, the month makes sense now to me. But this meeting should have gone differently. We should have gone back in there, appealed, and we, we went through our resistance. We, we went through the... the the, the setback that, that I at least expected or can, could be tolerated, but this is beyond what we can handle. Now it's time for deliverance. I'm not a message of deliverer right now. I'm a messenger of death, and there's no deliverance anywhere. Moses was facing, okay? He's facing a reality that proves almost universal for the people of God. The, the promises of God are rarely come about in the timing that we desire. The promises of God rarely cost so little that we don't notice the price. Rather, Moses and Israel are experiencing what the Bible proves is almost the default for the faithful. Struggle, setback, suffering, and desperation on a path that, uh, towards promise. The promises of God. Moses prays in line with thousands of persecuted Christians or suffering Christians throughout history. God, are you seeing this? Is this how it's supposed to go? This is the plan you have for us? And Moses remains on his knees there alone in prayer with, with, with that, that quite close to the prayer uh, that says, is anybody hearing me at all? I know I saw you in the wilderness, but is, did you send me in the wrong direction? Am I in the wrong place? And look at chapter 6. The silence breaks. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my, uh, because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country, right? Of his country. Moses, I know you're desperate. And the people are fearful. I understand this. Now, now you are going to see. Yes, this appears completely hopeless. Granted. Yes, the cards seem stacked against you. Granted. The leader of the world, whose word is literally law, he has spoken, not once, but twice, not maybe, but dogmatically. He said it. And he's, he's pushed you to the brink of death. He's not going to change his mind in the ways you hoped. But, but, the words of the scripture say here, he will let Israel go. Okay? Pharaoh may be convinced, okay, that he says no. But God says, I, I'm going to change his mind. I'm going to turn his hand, right? I, I, I am going to, I am going to make him let you go. In fact, make him drive you out. He may have doubled down on what he wants right now, but I'm going to compel him. 
I am going to compel him. Because of my mighty hand, he will do these things. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. So, so we shouldn't think a, a third appeal will come in and Pharaoh will just change his mind. God's giving the picture, no, I'm about to make it. I'm about to do this. I am about to change what he thinks he wants to do by my hand. He will not let them go unless I force it, but I'm going to force it. God looks at him in verse 2. And God, I think it says, God said, he continues comforting Moses. I am the Lord. Right? I'm the one who stands over history. Untouched by history, controlling it all from the end to the beginning, bringing about my purpose. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard their groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I, enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Moses, this is, what, this is how I think we should understand his description. They did not know my name. Moses, you are about to see a part of my character that no one has seen yet. They knew me as God Almighty. They knew me as God Powerful. You are about to understand my name in a way no one has seen yet. Part of my character is revealed through my strong deliverance against opposition, my overpowering, powering, not just providing, that no one has yet seen. The cards have never been stacked this way, so you have never seen a trick like this. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob knew me as God above all, the Almighty, the strong, the God above the mountains, but they did not see this on display. They saw me provide, but they did not see me deliver. Utterly overpower the world's most powerful person, government and military. That's what they're about to see. Don't back down, Moses. Don't give up. Say to the Israelites. What does God say here? Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the, the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring to you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as possession. I am the Lord. I am still the promise-keeping God that made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am still the great provider. I am still almighty. Israel, though, you will see... How greatly I will go, what, to what lengths, and to what power I have in order to keep my promises. Because you've never felt this desperate. You've never been pushed to this brink. You have never had it so clearly displayed before you that the desire of God is in direct opposition to all the earthly forces you consider to be real. Everything is up against what I told you will happen. But I made the world. I run this place, right? And I put breath in Pharaoh's lungs and I stand over history and I am the great I am and I am aware of your suffering and I will flex my muscles now dramatically on your behalf just to display how powerful I am. And God issues a great line of comfort and encouragement in line with his promise to Abraham. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will, I will move... In, in continuing commitment to my covenant to restore a people to myself who will be with me in fellowship, who will be my people and I will be their God. The very way that God intended the world at his creation, right? He will be with them. The hope that we even taste in the new creation, I will be with them. And Moses reports this in verse 9 to the Israelites, but they now are there so discouraged, it says, that they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. And then the Lord says to Moses, go back to Pharaoh. Right? Go to Pharaoh in verse 11. Tell the king, tell him, let him go. Let him go. But Moses says to the Lord, if the Israelites won't listen, why would Pharaoh listen to me? I speak with faltering lips. And Moses heard the word of the Lord and knew his character, but the setbacks and the suffering had him reeling, right? He was, he was staggering. 
worried and wondering. And Moses was forgetting what chapters 1 and 2 of Exodus had so clearly demonstrated to us. That, that God was king over history and that things were unfolding along his plan. Moses was pulled out of the water in a, bo- uh, uh, a basket made by reeds by Pharaoh's daughter to be raised in his house after Pharaoh himself had said, killed the Hebrew boys. He was forgetting that God was king over history and orchestrating even the harshest of events under his care. And I think that that's why in chapter 6 we have this genealogy here inserted in the midst of this tense story and moment. Because it points not to God's detachment from history, but God's supervision and orchestration of history. And there are many things that if, as we look at the genealogy, we can learn from that. But for me, I want to take these together, five to seven, because God reissues what he's preparing Moses for. If you look at the beginning of seven, God prepares him for what's coming, and he reminds him exactly what he said before. See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I've commanded you. And your brother Aaron is to tell the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment, and I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And here's one piece that is different and added. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. The plan is still the same, Moses. What I've spoken is true. You're my representative. You're my mouthpiece. And you and Aaron need to say what I've commanded you. Don't deter from it. Don't let the resistance of Pharaoh say, <coughs> cause you to think, I need to change message a little bit. Maybe we need to rebrand this. No, go in and say what I've told you to say Pharaoh's going to resist. You're going to get the same resistance, but I am still going to actualize, realize the real same promises. Even Israel, this place, God forsaken place, so to speak, who is oppressing you now, will all know who God is through this deliverance. The message for Moses and all Aaron and all of Israel that they needed to embrace was that God's word and character are trustworthy. Even in the face of desperate suffering and demoralizing setback. You realize that? That, that? that God, he doesn't come to them and say, well, let me see if I can find another way. You guys could sneak out of Egypt. Let's, let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a big, you know, distraction and you can roll. All 600,000 of you. No, he says, no, I'm trustworthy. I know you are facing far greater suffering and far worse setbacks than you ever anticipated. I know that you thought the path to promise would be hard, but not this hard. Don't deter from the course. God's word and his character are trustworthy. And even in the face of desperate suffering and demoralizing setback, we must trust him. And we must remain faithful. Specifically, here, God's word of deliverance and his character as deliverer are trustworthy, right? His message for Israel was one that I am a promise-keeping God who will deliver you in the face of these things. And in fact, as Israel reads the Pentateuch throughout their history, this is still what they need to hear. God's word is trustworthy. God's character is trustworthy. Circumstances lie. People lie. Feelings lie. God does not lie. God's word is true. God's character is trustworthy. And when the people of Israel were in the wilderness, and they asked the question, did you bring us out here to die? As Moses said, is this what it's about? Is this why I'm here? Or when they faced a famine in the land, or a giant and an army standing across the valley from them, named Goliath, right? They would ask, what? We're the promised people. The borders are supposed to be secure. And this is supposed to be different than right now. Or when people are getting slaughtered and others are getting carted into exile. There were people asking what on earth is going on, right? Is this how it's supposed to go? Israel faced many times because of even 
sinfulness of others and sin in, in their own camp, demoralizing, suffering, desperate setback. But there was something communicated that says that about the way they faced those things. It, who was faithful? The power of their faith. Those who left God to turn to idols or who ran in the face of hostility demonstrated that God's word functioned just like Pharaoh said. This is convenient to get what you want. This is a religious exemption to make life easier. Because now that life has gotten hard, you've let go of it. Life has gotten worse because of your faith. Oh, let me drop it. You've proved exactly what Pharaoh always thought. This is just part of your convenient path to what you want, which is what all idolatry is. Let me kill this chicken so I can get a good harvest or get pregnant or whatever. Right? But in the face of hardship and, and, and the suffering and setback that this sinful world brings, those who remain faithful to the character and words of God, the, the revealed purpose that He had, they actually demonstrated something something powerful about the authenticity of their faith. And this has been true all the way into Israel's darkest days when the great light appeared, right? Can you imagine Peter and his heart is so excited as he declares to Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're him. You're the, the one we've been waiting for. God's chosen king sent to save and purify and restore God's people. You're the one We've been waiting for it for centuries. You're the one that's going to expel the Romans. You're going to bring Israel back to glory on top of the world. And you're going to make the temple the center of the universe. This is going to be awesome. I'm living to see the day that Israel is on top of the heap. And Jesus says, I'm going to die. And Peter's confused and resists it. But then think of how his confusion and resistance becomes failure, fear, and desperation as he abandons Jesus along with the other disciples, right? And leaves him to flee only to watch perhaps from a distance in horror as he is unjustly accused, convicted, and crucified. Buried. You hear the words of Luke? And we had hoped that he was the one that would redeem Israel. Is this the way it's supposed to be? Moses asked. And we had hoped that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. This is not the way I saw the promises of God unfolding. I, if, if this is the Messiah, wait, there is no such thing as a crucified, dead, and buried Messiah. Right? But what happened? Deliverance still was realized. Jesus actually delivered through the cross and being buried and was resurrected again. And the truth that Israel needed to realize even before Jesus was in flesh and walked among them that God was trustworthy, his word is true, and his character is trustworthy, resounds in Jesus, right? It's a message that's timeless for us, that God's word and character are trustworthy, even in the face of desperate suffering and demoralizing setback. Specifically, God's word, let me say it this way, God's word of deliverance in Jesus and Jesus' character as deliverer, he is trustworthy. He will deliver us. He will deliver you, even in the face of hopeless suffering and setback. Dreams of your life for God crash harshly into the abandonment of a spouse and divorce. You think about someone who wanted to serve God in, in certain ways. Someone laying their hand to ministry and thinking, this is what I want. And, and then things break before their eyes. Or the expectation, perhaps, of some of the single people in this room, of a God-honoring marriage that they can serve together with a partner for their life, slowly begins to seem like a reality that's out of reach or only a dream. This is not happening the way I expected it to happen. Or the, that illness and pain would only be for a moment. May, I'll get through this. I'll be better next year. It turns into the prospect of chronic sickness or inner injury, a never-ending struggle. Financial independence and freedom, a goal that believers have that are thinking, I'm going to work hard and God's going to honor that hard work, all of a sudden becomes taking care of, of aging parents and a continuing inability to escape the circumstances of life. Christian maturity and a day when I'm free from sin becomes 
a, a harsh reality with, I, I am more sinful than I ever realized and continue to struggle. Or for, Moses, can you hear these words? Moses, Israel tells him, Pharaoh doesn't just change his mind and let thousands of slaves go, right? They come out of there and they go, Moses, this isn't happening. Pharaoh doesn't do this. He's not going to change his mind. We went once. We went twice. He said, no, it's over. You put a sword in his hand to kill us. Alzheimer's doesn't just get better. Loved ones don't just come back to life, right? Divorced people don't get remarried. He's not going to believe after years of ignoring the gospel. All these things. The sins of my past don't just disappear. The scars of abuse, they don't just erase. What people have done to me, just does, I, it doesn't just evaporate. But, but here is the beautiful message. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes, they do in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. And I do not mean some kind of tomorrow or next month or in three years or in 30 years, your, wife, your life will be dramatically different. And now your marriage has been restored and Alzheimer's magically did reverse. And this person you love did come back to life. But through desperate suffering and demoralizing setback that marks so much of this fallen world, God's word and character as the deliverer are trustworthy in Jesus. He is going to and will deliver us. He has promised. And as people who have experienced his spiritual delivery from slavery to sin and from the judgment of God for uh, the sin that we deserve, one who's released us from death, we should be people who hope for the reality of the resurrection and the new creation who, who face the suffering of this life. And do not abandon God and say, wait a second, this is way harder than I expected. This is way worse than I, pr- I thought. You said you were going to deliver me. And then the suffering of this world and the setbacks of this life, both in the spiritual and in the physical, the reality we live in, they wear at us to wonder if God had really spoken, if he really is true, if he's really going to do these things. Is this the case? We have the confident expectation, the hope of glory. Because Jesus is the God who is trustworthy and true. And when he says he's going to deliver us, he will. And he has resurrected and is coming again. And ultimately, the person who watches a loved one battle Alzheimer's or goes through it themselves or sees relationships break down or faces the suffering and pain of chronic illness or abuse or accident or whatever, they have the hope, the confident expectation of the fact that when Jesus comes again, he will ultimately deliver us into the new creation where there is no sickness, no sorrow, no suffering, no death, where every joy that you've experienced now is only a barely a hint of, of what the normal every experience will be like for all eternity. That the, the greatest joys you've tasted will be the hallmark of, of daily life and the suffering that you encounter and continue to cling to Christ through will be no more. Will be only a memory of God's sustaining grace and how good he was to help you to cling to him. That one day you and I will be delivered and the words God said about Israel they will be my people and I will be their God. They're repeated for a reason in Revelation 22. I will be with them and they will be my people and I will be their God because God is trustworthy and true. His message of deliverance is sure. And the setbacks and suffering you face in this life, they cannot loosen our grip on Christ. They must tighten it because despite all appearances, even as we know what happened to Israel, right? God comes in the next couple weeks, will rejoice in his almighty arm being shown as he releases them from Pharaoh. We know that he is a promise fulfiller. And he will deliver us. He will. He has begun that deliverance in Christ and he will bring it to completion. So, we must not be those who shrink back but continue to hold firmly to Christ so we will share in him in the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being a God who holds, for, who, who holds true to his word.